Ehrenberg joins us as well. Lisa, I'll start with you. Um, am I being too simplistic? What is what would the debate be happening inside the Supreme Court about presidential immunity? And these delays are conscious, are they not? They're certainly conscious, Meek, on behalf of at least some of the justices, particularly given their decision to schedule briefing in the way that they did. Before the break, John mm -hmm. and I were talking about this schedule, and I was saying the delay itself is the win. Even if we see a decision, let's say tomorrow or Friday, that is a full victory for Jack Smith and his team, the damage will have largely been done. It's not clear whether the case can be tried in the time remaining before the election or whether Judge Tanya Chetkin has the will to impose a trial on that schedule. You'll hear people complain bitterly, for example, that the Department of Justice this policy forbids taking certain steps certain number of days before election whether 60 to 90 days read very clearly yeah. that policy is about overt investigative steps like subpoenas or search warrants it's not about a trial but nonetheless even if the Supreme Court were to hand Jack Smith a full victory it's not clear that trial can be accomplished or if there is the will to make it happen Dave Arenberg same question what's the holdup a political person, Mika, would say the Supreme Court is putting its thumb on the scale of justice here, refusing to hold Donald Trump accountable for his actions. Remember, they could have intervened in December. Jack Smith saw this possibility and went to the Supreme Court and said, hey, uh, why don't you come in now before the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals rules and let's get this out of the way. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 that's too early. Well, then, after the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals issued a very thorough, very powerful ruling the Supreme Court intervened anyways, and that's why so many of us are just so upset about what happened because the Supreme Court's supposed to be apolitical. This does not look apolitical. And yes, it looks like that Trump will not get absolute immunity, but he wins by losing, as Lisa said, by delaying this matter, by delaying the trial until after the election when he can become president and then call it all off. I do think it is likely, though, that the Supreme Court will issue a ruling that will send the case back to Judge Chuckin for some fact-finding to determine whether Trump's conduct falls within his duties of office and whether there's immunity. And so that'll mean that there is no trial before the election. But Judge Chuckin, who is motivated to get this thing going, who said she will cancel her vacation if necessary, could hold this public hearing where a lot of the evidence will come out into the public of Trump's involvement in and before January 6th. So Jack Smith could get a bit of a victory even if he loses. To Lisa, the delay, as discussed, all but ensures that this trial won't happen before the election. But Dave just started to mention one of the outcomes here that maybe would be kicked back down. What are the, some of the other possible rulings the Supreme Court could provide? Well, you could see, as I just postulated earlier, a complete victory for Jack Smith, saying that historically the Supreme Court has never found immunity for a president, and it's not going to start now. There's another possibility that it says immunity could theoretically be possible in certain circumstances, but on the allegations of this indictment, that's not the case. And the third possibility, John, is somewhere in between what Dave just said and a complete loss for the special counsel's office, which says, no, a president can be immune, and on the allegations of this indictment, they think that this would qualify for immunity, but, for example, it would not stop prosecutors from introducing certain evidence, for example, with respect to presidential conduct, even if certain of the conduct is itself immune from prosecution. So, Ed Lewis, this is the latest challenge to the Supreme Court's, frankly, credibility. We're about at the two-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision, um, but more than that, in recent... Tonight, we are still waiting on rulings from at least 20, ca 20 cases that are left on the Supreme Court's docket. It's still quite packed, and that includes the biggest blockbuster of them all, Donald Trump's claim of immunity from criminal prosecution. In the New York Times today, you might have read this. One legal expert wrote, something's rotten about the justices taking so long on Trump's immunity case. If past his prologue, as Leah Lippman argues in that article, Trump's case should have been decided by now. What we know, of course, is when you look at the calendar, 111 days have passed since the court agreed to hear this case. Now compare that to Watergate, when then-President Nixon was arguing immunity from a subpoena that was seeking his Oval Office recordings, and the Supreme Court made that decision in 54 days. 
I want to get perspective tonight from John Dean, who is the former White House counsel to President Nixon. And it's great to have you, John, because uh, I don't know, when you when you look at this and you see what Leah is arguing in her article today, do you believe it's taking an unusual amount of time? Are you suspicious of this? Caitlin, I'm very suspicious of this. There's just absolutely no reason for it. It was 16 days from argument to decision in Nixon versus uh, U.S., where they tried to, where they got the tapes uh, from him. So there really is not a clear explanation of what's going on. There are, you noted the number of decisions, important decisions that haven't been issued yet. There's a lot of administrative law kind of decisions, which really are not as important uh, in, in the bigger picture. They are to the litigants, but not uh, to the fate of the nation as the one they're now sitting on for uh, some hundred days. So there is not a good explanation at this point. Yeah, and I think the other part of this is it is a historically sluggish court. The Wall Street Journal looked at this and noted that the justices here are completing decisions at the second <clears throat> slowest rate that we've seen from the Supreme Court since their 1946 term. And April was a very busy right. month for them. But I wonder, you know, when you do look at this, how much of it is a matter of, of the process and making a big decision like this one versus, you know, when people see it as maybe a political delay, as Leah Lippman is suggesting here? Well, the fact that there are the number of decisions that are backed up would really, uh, some of the proponents are trying to really disassemble the administrative state. And I'm sure there's contentions within the court itself that could prolong and protract those decisions just in the normal course. Then you add in the immunity case for Trump, which was actually, uh, has been some six months they've been sitting on that because, or ignoring it, if you will, or not facing it or not telling the public what the decision is because the special counsel, Jack Smith, brought it in initially in December as an emergency proceeding. So the court certainly knows the prosecutors think it's important to get this decided. Yet, as I say, if it, you know, if it comes out in June, hopefully it will not get pushed over until July. Uh, this is a long time on that case. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, we could see this as soon as tomorrow, potentially. Tomorrow is a Supreme Court day. We never right. know what's going to come down. Do you think, though, ultimately, when it does come out that Trump's immunity claim fails? It should, by all precedent, by all history. Uh, I can't imagine any argument that could grant him total immunity. Uh, there is total immunity, which was extraordinary at the time, in civil cases for presidents. While judges and members of Congress have immunity from their work in their uh, legislative work or judicial work, per se, uh, presidents have never needed it because, uh, you know, it, it, it has just not been an issue after Fitzgerald versus Nixon. So now we're into the criminal area uh, and nobody else has criminal immunity in the entire federal system. Uh, so the fact that Trump wants absolute immunity is extraordinary. I can't believe, Caitlin, he's going to get it. Can't yeah. believe it. It's just remarkable. I, I spent part of the day today, and I can't believe I'm saying this because I'm so nerdy, but I was reading some of the transcripts of the Nixon Oval Office recordings and, and conversations with you. It's just remarkable. Uh, John Dean, it's great to have you weigh in on this. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Caitlin. MSNBC yesterday and had this to say. Anything less than a decision by the Supreme Court that says a president should be held to the laws just like any other American citizen should be, anything other than that is absurd. The notion, for instance, well, if the president violated the criminal law but was doing so in his official capacity, there may be some basis to say that that's okay. We need to step back and think about that. Um, you know, wait a minute. A president can violate the American criminal law if he or she is doing something in their official capacity. That is an absurd and dangerous um, conclusion. Leah, what is your reaction to that? I think it's important to keep in mind what the precise issue in this case is. It doesn't have to be whether presidents are necessarily immune from all criminal prosecutions whatsoever. It's instead whether the facts alleged in special counsel Jack Smith's indictment related to the events of January 6 are something that presidents are entitled to immunity from. And there, the answer has to be a resounding no. Whatever the scope of presidential immunity is, it just can't extend to a months-long effort to contest the results of a valid election 
election and remain in office when you lost the election. So really, the Supreme Court has a very small task before it in this case, just answering whether this specific indictment alleges facts to which a president is plausibly entitled to immunity. And the answer is clearly no, which makes it so ridiculous that the court is taking as long as it is to resolve this case. Senator, it has been nearly two years now to the day since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. And since then, we've seen public trust of the court just crumble. According to the latest polls, it's been hovering around 40 percent near record lows. I think the lowest was 38 percent. But how could that lack of trust in the court maybe be a factor as we're waiting some controversial cases here, again, dealing with immunity, abortion, gun rights and more? Well, I think I think the lack of trust, you know, may affect individual justices. But remember, you know, Anna, that this is not just about the court's decisions, the lack of trust. It's also about what you're seeing with uh, Justice Alito and Flags. It's about what you're seeing with Justice Thomas and all of the trips and whether or not he is, uh, you know, essentially uh, being uh, purchased for his decisions. That, I think, is contributing as much as anything. But when you, it's a one-two punch when you get the decisions that are overturning decades of precedent with what appears to be personal uh, issues involving the, the court. Uh, it's, a, it's a major problem. So I think that that will weigh on certain justices more than others. Obviously, we're seeing that it's not affecting some justices, but I think the others have got to think about how the court is being perceived by the American public right now. And, and, and in terms of timing and the delay, I, I agree, it's hard to explain why these de delays are coming to the end of the term. But at the same time, I, I, this is such a, a fractured court right now. I think it's just taken longer to try to figure out what this is going to entail when you write these decisions. And it's just taken a long time. But I also think that they just they just like to get these and then get out of town. So, folks, what you saw there was that the Supreme Court is still hitting Trump with massive bombshells and they're not doing so on purpose this time. They're making a big mistake. We know, you and I know, and everyone else watching this, 99% of people watching this, that this court, two-thirds of it, is pretty much crooked for Trump. Like, Thomas and Alito are more crooked than the other conservatives, but they're all, to a degree, crooked for Donnie. We know this. But a lot of people aren't paying attention. They've really only paid attention to one Supreme Court decision, and that was the, the, the decision around Roe. Like, that's the only one. And understandably so, that one was massive. But low information and median of information voters have not been paying attention to how the Supreme Court is rigging it for Trump by simply slowing it down. And what this news update shows is that as those voters pay more and more attention closer to the election, they're going to realize the court is not only rigged on ideology, but also on partisanship. And they are going to respond by going to the polls for Biden to protect the Supreme Court as much as they can. In addition to the fact that it notes there that even if ultimately you can't get a trial completed by the election day, there's still big wins that Jack can score. And so Donald Trump got a Supreme Court update today that isn't quite as good as he's pretending. 